uh, we're ready to start. Uh, so today's speaker is uh, Merrick Burden. Uh, he's uh, director of uh, Resilient Fisheries at the Environmental Defense Fund. And he's gonna talk uh, about improvements in fisheries management uh, can offset many effects of climate change. Well, thanks very much, uh, Merrick, for coming. We're looking forward to talk. Okay, so thank you for having me. Um, we have a lot of ground to cover in this talk. Um, against my better judgment, I put a lot in here. And uh, what I'm gonna do is give a talk in two parts. So the first part is uh, about some research that we've done we being uh, we and some team members of mine at the Environmental Defense Fund in partnership with some colleagues at UC Santa Barbara and other places. Um, this research was um, uh, investigation into climate change effects on fisheries and what we think perhaps most importantly, the behavioral response associated with that and the degree to which fishery management is an important part of addressing climate change effects. The second part is what we do about it. And this is something that I'm really interested in hearing some feedback from you all um, about it, because it's a, it's, a, it's a body of work that's still under development by ourselves, by a lot of other people around the world. I'm sure some of you are involved in this also. And thinking about, okay, if climate change is a big issue and fishery management has a, has a role to play in addressing these effects, how do we go about addressing them? What do we do? How do we start? And it can be overwhelming. So we've been developing this framework um, that we think helps to guide people um, toward steps uh, steps to take to address some of these climate change effects. So um, we should get started because I have a lot of ground to cover. So um, let's see. That doesn't want to work. Mouse works. Okay. Okay. So I just talked about this. Um, I'll have a couple of different parts to the talk. Um, what did you do? <laughs> there we go. Okay. So um, if we first step back and think about the research that's been done to date on climate change effects on fisheries, a lot of this work has focused on the direct effects of ecosystem level change. And what I mean by that is that it looks at what is the potential maximum uh, sustainable yield today and what is the maximum sustainable yield tomorrow as climate change takes hold and what's the difference. And so what we sought out to do with this research is to look at the importance of the human response that takes place um, when these changes occur. So the way to think about it is climate change has an effect. Society then responds to that. That has another effect. And we want to look at the combined total of this and say, what is climate change going to do? What can we do about it if we're in this role of fishery managers or fishery stakeholders who are reacting to climate change? So if we think about this in um, very simplistic terms, climate change really has a couple of different things if we think about it um, from the perspective of fishery management. One is a change in productivity. Another is a change in place or geography where fish are found. And this results in fishery management challenges. So if we think about productivity so think about change, it's really change, easy to think really that today we're harvesting a certain amount of fish. With climate change, some climate fish change, are going to do better, some, some fish are going to do worse. worse. The challenge occurs the challenge when you're unable when to track. Right? So, right. so if a if stock is negatively stock impacted negatively by climate change and we continue to fish at a rate that we've been fishing for decades, we unknowingly engage in overfishing. Or maybe we know it, we just don't do anything about it. Inversely, maybe a stock increases in abundance and we keep fishing at the same rate we've been fishing um, and we experience underutilization. So this is one management challenge. Another one is a shifting range of stocks, in particular shifting ranges across political boundaries. So if you look around the world today and you look at international fisheries management, this is perhaps one entity that's done well with that, but on a global scale, we're not very good, right? And so with climate change, these stocks are going to start shifting across international boundaries. It's going to create international issues. And I'll get, get into some of our estimates about just to what degree that's going to take place. This results in a management challenge. And if we track our experience to date, this means that stocks are going to suffer from international disputes that results in stock depletion and on and on. 
So the methods that we took in this research, first look at a global fisheries database and some prior research that we've done, looking at over almost a thousand global stocks. This re represents, um, <coughs> based on our uh, best estimates, about 67% of the global catch. We use this database to look at um, the available yields and um, current status of these stocks. We then use a climate velocity model. So um, I'm hoping some of you guys know what this is. I don't have my notes in front of me, so I can't explain all of it to you. But um, what it basically does is it uses a thermal envelope and projects how habitats are going to change as, as waters are warming. That's then used to then map on top of these global stocks and their uh, preferred ranges. And it shows where they're going to move and to what degree habitat is going to expand or contract for these stocks. So a little, little image here. So um, in the bottom right, this is essentially what the, the climate velocity model does, where you have different um, scenarios of climate change. Um, in this case, a stock will move um, from its old area down in here and start to move up in here. And the way the model works is essentially says, okay, you've lost area one, we'll snip that off as an available habitat area. And depending on the climate scenario, it might move up into, into area four. And these regions have different <laughs> habitat suitabilities. This is then mapped onto a K or a growth parameter to say, like, if the, if the habitat range expands, the, the, the carrying capacity, capacity of the stock can also expand. And this maps back onto other research that's been done by others. I won't get into that. Then we couple this with a bioeconomic model. So bioeconomic models, if you think about the Gordon Schaefer curve, if you have an open access region, you have a maximum economic yield region, you have areas in which uh, fisheries make profits, areas in which the stock become depleted, et cetera. We couple this with the climate velocity model in different scenarios to develop impacts and simplistic projections of what may occur in the future. And the model we use is a Pellet-Tomlinson surplus production model. I won't get into all of that unless you really want me to. Um, but that's the equation that we use in the bioeconomic model. And then finally, we have some management scenarios. And what we're trying to do with these management scenarios is couple or identify some bookends. So what's possible if we do nothing to address climate change? What's possible if we adapt perfectly to climate change? And it gives us a range of the importance of the human response to this condition. So the methods that we use are no adaptation. Second one is full adaptation. What if we respond to everything perfectly? That is changes in productivity and, and shifts in the range of stocks. What if we only respond to productivity adaptation? What if we only respond to shifts and ranges? And now I'll go through some results. So first, uh, we'll look at changes in productivity under a relative concentration pathway six, which is essentially if we stick with the Paris Accord, which if you've been reading the news, we're not. So um, when we did the, the study, we were kind of optimistic that would happen, but anyway. Each one of these lines is a stock. And what you see over time with climate change, um, even under our Paris Accord, things change a lot. There's a lot of climate change. A lot of things uh, are impacted by it. And so on average, if we take the average of all of these um, over 900 stocks, the average doesn't change that much. It starts to dip a little bit toward the middle of the century and decline by a few percentage points. But on average, the maximum sustained yield possibility doesn't change that much. But each one of these stocks changes a lot. And each time one of those stocks changes, that's a management challenge. So you can imagine if we, do we need different gadgets here? Nope. Okay, so you can imagine if we were to go through uh, one of these declining stocks and say, okay, this stock is declining um, but we don't adjust our management at all, we're starting to overfish that stock. And we could overfish it really heavily. And inversely, there's this, another stock up here, it's increasing in its maximum sustained yield. What if we don't um, track that very well? Or well, now we have underutilization. So what we actually end up doing at the end of the day if we don't track this is declining our fishery yields and getting less out of the ocean than what we hope to get out of the ocean. So, of course, this also depends on the climate scenario. So, uh, really optimistic scenarios, like if we were to stop all of our emissions today, we still have some climate change, we've committed to it at this point, um, this is what would happen. If we continue on our current trajectory, which is um, 
exceeding the level specified by the climate accord, we actually uh, start to lose, um, on average, our fishery potential from the world's oceans. I think everybody should probably know that. Um, but the point here is that the climate scenario also matters a great deal. So the next one is shifts in range across international boundaries. And so this also matters uh, or depends on the climate scenario a great deal. But the point here is that um, under our current climate trajectory, over 80% of the world's stocks should shift across international boundaries. Some of those will leave nations and come into new ones. Some of those will uh, just expand by just going into new countries, but they'll remain in their old countries. And some, some will, will just leave the countries like other how that have been tracked. So anyway, anyway. Um, current scenario, over 80% of them will shift across international boundaries. If we follow the Paris Accord, we're still talking about 50% of our stocks. The point is, there's going to be a lot of change, um, a lot of shifting that happens across international boundaries. And each time this happens, it can result in an international dispute. We already have evidence and experience with this. It's already happening, and the story isn't that great. I'll get into that here in a minute. So um, now let's go into some global results about what's possible. So here what we're doing is we're measuring success by one difference in harvest, harvest possibility, or difference in biomass. So you have across the y-axis difference in harvest from the globe's fisheries, across the x-axis difference in biomass. And what we start with here is to say, what if we didn't adapt at all to these changes in productivity and changes in range? And that's our foundation, that's zero. Now, if we say, let's just adapt to productivity changes, leave those shifting ranges alone, just adapt to productivity. What we see is that we could actually do 20% better on a harvest basis and about 15% better on a biomass basis just by responding to productivity change. Now, if we just respond to range shifts, those, those moving stocks across international boundaries, we could do about 30% more in biomass compared to no action and about eight or 9% better in harvest compared to no action. But what if we were to do both? You can see you can do a lot better. So these bookends show us that full adaptation gets us about 35% more harvest over 50% more in biomass compared to no adaptation. That means that the, the effect of the human response is enormous. It's not just climate change itself, it's the human response. Um, and for comparison purposes, that's to today. And so what this also means is that compared to today, if we follow the RCB6, which is essentially the Paris Accord, we can still have more fish in the water and more harvest from our fisheries, even in the face of fairly substantial climate change. And to a large degree, that just speaks to the notion that a lot of our stocks are depleted right now. They have room to grow. So even if climate change is unfolding, you can still do better in the face of a lot of that change. Um, but of course, this also depends on our climate change future. And so if we don't control climate change at all, we end up on the RCP 8.5. Um, even if we do everything perfectly, uh, it's gonna be really hard to do, what well, we can't do better than today on harvest. If we do everything perfectly, we could get a little bit more fish in the water, but I think that's being pretty naive. The point is that if we don't control climate change, not much of this matters. And then if we think about this on a geographic scale, so what this does is it maps out um, different areas by latitude, and then we went ahead and um, used profits in this case from the bioeconomic model as a metric of success. And what this shows you is that, of course, not all areas of the world will experience the same consequences. And so um, even if we were to fully adapt all of our fisheries to all of these climate change effects, the equatorial tropics cannot do better. better, they're going to lose. Um, and it should make some sense, right? Fish are going to move away from the tropics and there's nothing to backfill behind them. They're going to follow these warmer waters more. There's nothing that's going to come in behind them. So uh, the equatorial tropics we expect, regardless of what we do, will do fairly. But their best response to fishery management terms on the right side is still to implement human fisheries management, still try to implement management that's responsible on climate change. What this also, this also shows, shows you is that the high latitude, latitude regions might actually benefit to some degree um, if we can respond 
in some way. And so that raises all these questions of equity and, and fairness and all that. I won't get into it at the moment. But the um, point here is that the geography matters. There will be winners, there will be losers. So some conclusions from this research model, and I'll shift into the second part of my talk. So one, um, compared to today, full adaptation to these climate change effects, if you believe this model, will lead to 14 billion more in profits at, at a global scale, could lead to 25 billion uh, more servings of seafood, and one third more biomass in the water compared to today. So what that means is that even as climate change takes hold, our response to what we do about it matters a great deal. And fisheries management matters perhaps more now than ever in the face of climate change. So um, we have to address all of these changes if we want to have some hope for the future. Um, and rain shifts across nations, that's going to require cooperation, something that we're not very good at today. So we're going to have to figure out how to do this better. Um, not all fisheries are going to benefit. Not all regions of the world are going to benefit. Um, and of course, we have to wrap our arms around climate change. We have to get a hold of our emissions. Otherwise, none of this matters. So I'm going to shift into part two now, which is a framework for addressing some of these climate change effects in fisheries. And I'm going to be way up here and I know like a lot of us I think have built our career thinking about like management in particular places so we're getting there but I'm way up here so if you could kind of follow me and come up to like a global theoretical academic level that's where I'm coming from at the moment and I'd love your response to some of this um, and so let's get into it and then I'd love to hear questions um, what not so um, as we've been doing work around the world, um, going all the way up to the United Nations, um, going down to um, fisheries here in the US and places in between, um, what's come to the surface are five major components or principles, we might even call them, for um, starting to wrap our arms around adjusting management in the face of climate change. And so the first one is maintain and restore ecosystem health, right? If we don't have healthy ecosystems, we, we don't have anything. So that, that's kind of a, should be a clear one. Um, the second one is implement fisheries management fundamentals. And what I mean by that is good fisheries management, sound fisheries management still matters. Things like MSY don't go away because of climate change. Things like necessary habitat conservation doesn't go away because of climate change. If you don't have that, fisheries management fundamentals, there's nothing to build on. We can't address climate change. So that's a really important second step. Third one is to engage in forward-looking science and goals and policies. And I'll, I'll get into this in more detail. Fourth one is the really critical and um, tough nut to crack of international collaboration among countries. And then the fifth, fifth one is issues of social equity. So not just the impact that um, climate change are going to have on different groups, but that addressing social equity makes society more able to adapt. So it's almost looking at it from the other way. And I'll explain that in a little more detail. So first, ecosystem health. Um, if we think about um, ecosystem health uh, in the face of fisheries management and climate change, there are like, I think, two ways to think about it. One is to think about cumulative effects, where climate change is a cumulative effect problem on marine ecosystems. So climate change is a stressor that's happening on top of a lot of other things like sediment loading and runoff and all sorts of other types of pollution. And you can mitigate uh, climate change to some degree by addressing some of these other stressors. So if you think that um, we are moving too slowly to address climate change and maybe it's easier to address runoff, that can help address ecosystem health. That can help to take away the cumulative nature of all of this. That's one way to think about it. The other one is resilience. So I think it would be folly for us to say, we know everything that's going to happen with, with marine ecosystems in the face of climate change. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of unknown. And so um, another way is to take the principles of resilience and start to use them to guide how we um, address ecosystems and how we uh, build and manage our marine ecosystems so they can handle these unexpected shocks and disturbances and recover and respond to them. And if we think about resilience, that's really a high level thing that um, I think is a word batted around that hasn't given a lot of meaning. 
But the Stockholm Resilience Center actually has these principles that are very operational. And they, these are them. And so if you go through them, you will see like uh, diversity and redundancy. That's something that we actually do as fishery managers. We care about stock complex or uh, stock structure. We care about um, ecological diversity and habitats and things of that nature. Connectivity, there's talk about connecting MPAs so that stocks can move through them. This is also important in the social realm. So different communities learning from one another by having connectivity. Slow variables and feedbacks. Um, I won't get into slow variables that much, but feedbacks, uh, climate change can create responses with other things that you start to spiral down this drain um, because of these feedback loops that can exist. Adaptive systems thinking or adaptive management. In the US, we do a lot of this, like in our tax setting process. You guys do this. Every year you set a new uh, catch level, right? And so we're responding and adapting as things are changing. Learning mindsets. There's a lot we don't know. We're gonna have to try, learn from it, and try again, and keep trying again, and keep learning. Right? Um, broaden participation. So we do this, you might be familiar with the Fishery Management Council process. We're trying to be inclusive and have participation from a wide, wide range of stakeholders. That facilitates buy-in, right? And polycentric governance, another word for this is co-management, right? Like, so we do this in fisheries, we engage in a lot of co-management. These are all things that are very familiar. These words might be new, but these are all things that are very, very familiar to us. And if we focus on the socio-ecological resilience, we can help to address a lot of the uncertainties and unknowns um, of climate change effects on ecosystems. Um, and um, fisheries and management, management and fundamentals, fundamentals, I think you guys know some of this as well as anybody, but one of the places that is in most need of help are the developing tropics, developing world that doesn't have the capacity we have here in the United States. So doing things like uh, primary fisheries management that uh, Kevin Cochran and others have advocated for is a way to start getting there. So essentially data limited methods, methods are heavily used, co-management is heavily used, and other types of techniques like that in the low governance management setting. These are things that you can do uh, in these places to help them move in the right direction. And then there's been some recent research that shows that if you're able to implement well-managed fisheries, we can show that they're, they are inherently more resilient to climate change than other types of fisheries. Um, <clears throat> Forward-looking science and goals and policies. <clears throat> so, excuse me. <clears throat> so a lot of what we do in fisheries, um, we start with stock assessments or allocations or fishery management goals, a lot of that is based on the past, right? So you think about a lot of the stock assets um, I'm familiar with, we borrow priors from other regions based on research that happened in the 80s or the 70s. We set goals for allocations or sideboards that are based on some image of what we think is healthy based on something that happened in 1983. And on and on and on, right? So that's not going to be a problem. So we're going to have to start looking forward and saying, what's going to make sense? Where do we want to go? And this starts to change the way that we do management. So there's a, a few steps that I'd like to get to slide. So first, if you're thinking about a fisheries management body, the first step you might take is to say, what's the realm of future possibility for this fishery? That's different from what we do now, which is everybody tell us what you want, and then let's talk about how to get there. First, we don't actually know what we want. We don't know what the future holds, right? So we want to start differently. What's a scenario tool or a forecasting tool? How does this help us think about what's possible in this fishery in the future? After that, what are the goals in the context of climate change? So if you so know, you know like, like, some major fishery is going to go away, but a new one's going to take its place, how do you start to think about your goals differently? How do you start to think about what your fishery should look like in the face of all of that? And then, of course, you have management benchmarks that are appropriate to the future conditions, not just past conditions, but future conditions. And then, and then how does the private the sector go through transformation and adaptation in the face of this change? And so right now, for instance, um, on the West Coast in Alaska, we do things like we wall off different fishery sectors from one another and so that one sector can't buy another, right? And that's done for very important social reasons. But we're going to have to think about that differently as climate change takes hold. So that's not to say that those social considerations that led to those sideboards are important, but a fishery with a heavily dependent on sideboards that stock might be going away. And so we'll have to think of ways to allow that industry to start transitioning over to another stock in the future. Uh, international collaboration. So uh, if you guys don't 
believe me, this is a big deal. Let me just point out uh, this chart. This chart here is North Atlantic map. Um, and it, it, um, it is a stock that's supposed to be a winner in the face of climate change. And um, over the last few years, what's happened is it has expanded its range largely out of the European Union and Norway waters into Iceland and Greenland and Faroese waters. <laughs> so what happened was that Iceland and Greenland and the Faroes said, well, there's mackerel here, let's go fishing. And the EU and Norway said, those are our fish, uh, we're going to keep fishing. And so, of course, overfishing happened. And you can map that right on to when the stock started shifting, right? So um, this was in the late 2000s. You had ICE's science advice and the, the TAC policies that mapped pretty, pretty closely. Stock moved in the international territory and we just started to diverge really rapidly. I mean, in the same year, right? And then what we have now is, even though the stock was growing for a while, we now have ICE's science advice that's the lowest in the last 30 years or so. So a stock that's responding to changing in ecological conditions across international boundaries, Countries that have really good domestic management get along, they depleted the resources. We should expect this to happen. So we need to get out in front of this and do this better and anticipate um, where this is going to happen. We're not very good at this right now. Um, social equity and fairness. I guess this is my last major point. Um, so like I touched on earlier, climate change will create large social inequities, it'll exacerbate existing ones. This has importance in its own right. I mean, we are humans, if you have any empathy, um, this should matter to us. But it also matters for a more mechanistic reason. And that is, if we want society to start to transform and adapt in ways that are constructive to these climate change challenges, social inequities get in the way of that. So addressing social inequity is a really important factor if we want to make sure that society start to embrace change. And so, so you can imagine, you can imagine um, a society, society, this is already happening, I'll give you several examples, a society that is already suffering from large inequality, and now there's a, there's a policy that's implemented that's seen as unfair or exacerbated that inequality. Those people start to protest, right? And we saw this in Chile last year over a new fishery that arguably has been shifting as a result of climate change. Those protests and social majority rejection of policies, the society just rejected. So it's things like that that really matter. And we're going to be expecting governments and stakeholders to adapt to these new future conditions. Society is going to have to be willing to come along. And we're going to have to be willing to embrace this change. Social equity and perceptions of fairness matter a great deal in getting better. So, um, so we can tie this all together. So climate change is going to be disruptive. Um, it's going to highly alter our belief systems. But our response to it can be constructive or it can be negative. If we're constructive, there is reason for hope, right? If we're constructive and the world decides to start reducing our emissions, we think the world could actually have more abundant fisheries in the future compared to today. But there's a lot that we need to do to get there. One. We have to wrap our arms around climate change. We have to reduce our emissions. And two, we have to figure out some how to crack some really tough nuts about how to get society to embrace new policies and to adapt to a new future. But if we can do that, I think there's reason to be hopeful. So um, that's a lot of ground. Hopefully you followed. I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> Merrick, for a really interesting talk. So, floor is open for questions. Uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, a couple of questions. One, just a technical question. On your plot that showed the distribution of potential profit by latitude, there's that peak in the, up, in the higher latitudes, but there's a larger peak in the northern higher latitudes. Is that just a function of more non-pelagic shelf area, more fishing area in the northern latitudes? Oh, yeah, you mean the southern area? Southern region doesn't have, you know, I was starting that last night and I couldn't recall why that was the case. I honestly, I couldn't recall if that was just a function of there being less knowledge about that extreme Southern region, which I think might be part of it. Um, but I don't, I can't recall offhand. Maybe there's Sorry. just less land mass and shelf area to fish down there. Could well. be, yeah, it could be. 
Um, I, I, and sort of related to that, I guess, indirectly, um, you didn't speak directly to MPAs, but looking at some of the higher latitude situations, we see these MPAs and the potential for the species to walk right on out of them and them to become entirely obsolete and perhaps even negative. And if you think about some of like the crab saving areas in Alaska, mm -hmm. not only are they not they're saving not crab if the crab, crab leaving them, but they're forcing people not to fish where the crab aren't. Mm -hmm. And so you're making the problem worse. And I wonder if, um, I don't know, are you guys going to address MPAs in particular in this one? It's kind of a touchy subject. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, this yeah. doesn't really it's bode well, well with MPAs, MPAs, in my opinion. No, I, so I think that's a great question. I think it's a great example of uh, the principle of being forward-looking. So um, when I think about forward, being forward-looking in our goals and policies and everything else, it's not just about fishery management goals. It's not just about stock assessments. It's also about habitats, right? So if a stock's going to move, its critical habitat is going to be in a different location. We're going to have to look forward and anticipate where that's going to be. So we we'll end up in this exactly this kind of problem. So this isn't so much a question, but an observation. So to that very point, how do you how do you sell that component of it? So if you have a Industry is currently engaged. They're currently looking at the bottom line this year. They're looking maybe at the next five to ten years, twenty years, depending on when they enter the fishery. And you're talking about potentially closing off an area that can currently is it's maybe not the most productive ground, but it's decent ground. But you anticipate that that's going to become productive ground based on your modeling. How do you how do you sell that in a way that is palatable and gets buy-in from those participants? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I'm channeling my former employer and thinking, yeah, I think we've had this discussion. Um, so uh, I think there are a few things to think about. One is um, what you're asking industry to do is to embrace like a longer term mindset. And so um, fairness and equity is a big part of getting people to have a longer term mindset. So if there are people that are just living day to day, they I think the research is pretty clear. Climate change, change itself is a high priority, priority for, them. for them. And, and if you're asking, you're asking people to make adaptations, adaptations um, and to do things that are good for the future, you have to be able to think about the future. So, so some of that some is, that is um, a lot of that I think is social equity, but a lot of that is also just making sure that the industry itself is profitable and is operating on a rational model. And so we can keep going on about what that means. Um, I think I'll pause there. but. Um, I think those two components are really important to getting industry to say, what is this long-term mindset? Where do we really want to be in the next few years? And then getting to that shorter-term discussion, like when do we actually start to implement these measures? Yeah, that's that's a hard discussion. I think you need to, if we envision the council process or something like that, it's a long discussion, a lot of input by a lot of people. Um, and you, you hope, I guess, at the end of the day that the council has the the vision and the leadership to say, this is where the future's headed, and we need to make this tough decision. Let's do the best that we can. Because doing nothing isn't an option, in my opinion. I'm wondering, have you or could you rank these fisheries? I mean, presumably, you've got a wide range of artisanal right up to big industrial fisheries. Could you rank them in terms of their ability to follow shipping distributions? And I'm thinking of the comparison between like the offshore Hague or Pollock fleet, which really they don't care that much. It's a little more gas in a fishery in different places, otherwise it's the same fishery, versus short side fisheries fish that are very tied by local area, area. Mm -hmm. right away in the small distribution changes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I think that you can. I mean, I think you just outlined a couple of great examples. If you're a um, factory-based fleet, moving a few hundred miles isn't that big of a deal, right? And we see that now. Um, whereas if you're a developing nation fleet with sails or paddles or small outboards or what have you, movement's just not an option. And so I think, yeah, it's, it'd be absolutely um, something that I could see being done. I'd be surprised if it hasn't actually. Or someone could say, like, here are the, the factors that make a fleet more or less mobile. 
and then you can map on climate change effects onto that. Like if you were to say, here's Equatorial Guinea and here's its characteristics and here's the Bering Sea fishery and here's its characteristics and how are they going to hold up as their stocks move? I think, I think that'd be a nice little exercise. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Merrick. No, I think it was, this is a great framework to think about how different species will react to climate change in terms of uh, changing their distribution range. And um, I was wondering whether those um, range shifts that you showed were calculated based on that model that you presented earlier, the uh, climate velocity model. Yeah. That is done individually for each species yep. that is contemplated. Yep. Um, because, I mean, you would expect that different species behave or respond to those different environmental conditions. We're assuming that there's going to be a, an overall pattern of response, but um, there's still quite a bit of variability there. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I understand your question correctly, so um, I mean, if you, if you just go into like fish base, for instance, you'll see here's this characteristic of this temperature references, right? So that, that information you should know about where these stocks prefer to be, and so you can take that information and you can map it on this climate velocity model and say, where is this thermal habitat going to be, and how is it going to move, and is it going to get bigger or smaller in the future? And that, that maps, maps on, on and then each one of those species um, um, carrying capacities. Passes. So not only its location, but the, the habitat, habitat shrinks in half. half. What we're saying is there's this proportional change and it's, it's the stock's K, right? Um, that then determines where it's going to be and also the change in productivity. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Any species interactions, mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering how this could impact the results. Because, an example, the, um, in the Mediterranean, we had a lot of increase of uh, lion fish or scorpion lion fish coming from the, uh, from the south, and it's actually uh, invasive species that is uh, causing a lot of trouble to other uh, species. Mm -hmm. At least, can actually change your perspective yeah um, we did not include those interactions and I think there are definitely weaknesses to this model that's all of them. Um, I would say though that uh, the results of this model are very consistent with other models like um, forgetting the gentleman's name uh, Chung out of UBC for instance his modeling is very consistent with this model um, and so I think if you step back and say, what are the global are the patterns, patterns that we might expect, we might expect and, you, and, and you say, like, we shouldn't get we too shouldn't refined because of these types of interactions, and let's just look at what are the book what, what are the global what patterns, 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 patterns that if you, that if you think about it at that level, level, this gives you an indication that's valuable. Um, but I would not advocate for taking this model and trying to get refined and then detailed country detailed level stuff because, stuff because of those very reasons, those right? Like there's just interactions that we haven't captured that are very important at those, those scales. Okay. Do we have any questions online? No. Nope. Any more questions from the audience here? Nope, then. Thanks very much, Mary. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah.